We really are being blessed this year, and I am so grateful for the gifts that Hosier has offered to us. We have a brand new EP, which I'm sure you're all very aware of, uh, very appropriately named Unheard. These are the tracks that were written for Unreal Unearth, but didn't quite make the cut. I couldn't be more stoked about this release, particularly because it's delivered, I think, my all-time favorite Hosier song ever. <laughs> uh, it is surreal the way I connect with one of these songs. I won't drag out this intro, we'll get right into it, um, but I just wanted to say how excited I am to film this because I feel like these videos are the ones where we can really connect and I'm so happy with the little community we have. So let's do this. <laughs> Too sweet. Um, obviously it was always gonna be a big hit on TikTok. That's something you could uh, count on because yeah, it's sexy. <laughs> But we'll dig a bit deeper than just surface level, don't worry. The songs on this EP have still been assigned particular circles in Dante's Inferno. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, I would recommend going back and watching my video on the full album. Too Sweet sits in the third circle, which punishes gluttony. And gluttony in all of its senses, not just what you consume, but indulgence in any sort of vice. And indulgence or hedonism is a very common theme throughout Hosier's work. You only have to look back as far as the acoustic version of B that he just released, where he reframes the original sin as an act of radical love, or, you know, look at Dinner and Diatribes, where he is indulging in these intimate thoughts. It, so this song feels very true to him. This song deals with two very different people with two very different lifestyles, both sort of keen on persuading the other to join their side. It can't be said I'm an early bird. It's 10 o'clock before I say a word. Baby, I can never tell how do you sleep so well. This is relatable content. <laughs> I cannot stomach conversation until about midday. I like to just exist in my own little mute world until then. Anyway, we're establishing that Hosier is the dark in this balance of energies. You keep telling me to live right, to go to bed before the daylight, but then you wake up for the sunrise. You know you don't gotta pretend. So Andrew's girl listens to Huberman Lab, essentially, is what we're getting from this. <laughs> she's got a routine and it's aspirational and almost as if she's trying to make a point, um, which that line about not having to pretend kind of suggests to me that he might see this as a bit of a farce. Like she's trying to keep up an image, but he's like, come on, I know you want to sleep in. And while he's saying that, she's also trying to get him to be more like her. So I'm sort of seeing the bones of this song as being these two equal forces sort of pushing down or against each other. And look, I'm about to take my train of thought to a very extreme place. I know this is not what Hosier was intending. Um, this is just my brain that's seeing this. It's a complete stretch, but I think this idea kind of fits in with the theme of hell in this album, um, in the as above, so below kind of sense. Like polar opposites really just being two sides of the same coin. And maybe they're just, they're both as hedonistic as each other. It's just indulgence versus over consuming discipline. Am I taking this too far? You can tell me if I am. I am, I am, I know I am. Baby, now and then, don't you just want to wake up, dark as a lake, smelling like a bonfire, lost in a haze. Fucking love a bonfire. <laughs> we see again that teasing, like, come on. Like, that perfect image can't be real. If you're drunk on life, babe, I think it's great. I think this is sardonic. I don't think he's being earnest. Um, I think this is a dig. And I think it's very funny <laughs> because honestly, whenever someone says they're drunk on life, my eyes roll so far back in my skull that I can see the serotonin that's hiding from me. And that's coming from someone that doesn't even drink. We've seen Hosey's lyrics be facetious before, see figure one, anything but. Um, so I don't think it's a stretch to say that this isn't a genuine line. But while in this world, I think I'll take my whiskey neat, my coffee black and my bed at three. You're too sweet for me. I think there's a few layers to this chorus, despite it being quite simple lyrics. Obviously we can take it literally. Um, Hosier is describing a difference in lifestyles. His vices are a little more unhealthy than the others, um, but I think we can extract more out of how he takes things. We've seen these ideas come up frequently of accepting the good and the bad, you know, the full range of human emotion and experience with the very short amount of time we have left and taking whiskey neat and coffee black is it's in its purest most untouched form there's no attempts to sweeten it it's 
bitter, it's strong, it can burn, um, but you're appreciating it for what it is. And this makes me wonder whether this love interest perhaps likes to do the opposite with how she views the world. Does she sugarcoat things? Does she water them down? Perhaps through her attempts of living well, she is doing herself a disservice by sheltering herself and closing herself off from pain. I aim low, I aim true, and the ground's where I go. I work late where I'm free from the phone and the job gets done. Not gonna lie, uh, hearing a modern piece of technology being referenced in a Hosey song threw me a little. It's not what you expect. What I think he's saying here is that he doesn't go for the unattainable. He's not shooting for the stars and he gets his work done in sort of a bunkered down state. He goes to ground, he becomes inaccessible. And from a fan's point of view, we don't see much of him between the album cycles. Um, so I'm wondering if this person that he's singing about is a bit more public. And I think that's backed up by the line, um, who wants to live forever. I get the sense that this woman is trying to create a lasting image and a persona that people talk about. You treat your mouth as if it's heaven's gate, the rest of you like you're the TSA. I wish that I could go wrong, babe, don't get me wrong. Okay, I've seen many theories and I will admit that I am just as conflicted. What the fuck does this TSA reference mean? <laughs> this is what I've settled on, but I'm very open to having my mind change. So if you think you've got it, hit me with your best shot. You treat your mouth as if it's heaven's gate. There are requirements for you to enter heaven. You know, it's a restricted area. So I think it's implying that what she lets enter her mouth, like what she drinks and what comes out of her mouth like the words she says are very considered and perhaps even censored at times. She eats well and she talks not evil. Maybe she doesn't like gossiping, can't relate. Gossiping is one of my biggest vices. Uh, I live for the drama. <laughs> the TSA, again, they're there to protect um, and restrict who has access to something. So she's picky. Her body is a temple and it will not be desecrated. But again, I'm open to ideas about this one. Let me know your thoughts. Um, I will say though that I do not think it's a reference to the Heaven's Gate cult. I think that would be a bit inappropriate. You know, you're bright as the morning, as soft as the rain, pretty as a vine, as sweet as a grape. If you can sit in a barrel, maybe I'll wait. He needs a jaded woman. She's too optimistic for him. And I mean, he said in an interview that he is categorically not an optimist. She's all these things. She's beautiful and caring and sweet, um, but he needs to see that darkness and he needs to see something of himself reflected back at him. I mean, I think that's the singular most key thing for any human connection. We need to see, or we need to recognize at least a tiny part of ourselves in the other person. Sitting in a barrel, I wouldn't say that's about age. I think it's just depth and complexity and a bit of darkness. When it comes down to it, this song is just about the play between light and dark and, you know, both wanting that yin and yang sort of dynamic, but being too stubborn to give in. I really don't think I've had enough days to process the hold that this song has on my heart. This is my favorite song that Hosier has ever released. And to think that we might not have even heard it, it makes me feel sick. Like I can't imagine my life without it. It is a part of me. It gave me the same reaction I had when I first heard California Soul by Marlena Shaw or uh, Paint My Heart by the Teskey Brothers. It was like my brain was doing double time, trying to catch up, thinking about how this is gonna affect me for the foreseeable future. This is unlike anything Hosier has released before. I'm struggling to find ways to describe it. It's like, it's like the Eiley Brothers took a bunch of quaaludes. I don't know. <laughs> um, it's so soulful, but in a way that we haven't had soul from Hosier before. And I just can't even put into words how perfect Alison Russell's vocals are on this. It's so hypnotic. Yeah, this song is just special. Springtime in the country, each time I'm shocked by the light, the world lying fallow and you are apart from me. Everything in my vision is movement and life, riverboat, wheelbarrow, wildflower and barley. So this song sits in the first circle of hell, which is limbo. And it was written about the beginning of the pandemic and a time when time didn't feel real itself. And we sat in isolation. The world was laying fallow, um, fallow meaning the state of a piece of land that's been left unplanted uh, so that it can rest per se. If you 
over farm a piece of land the soil sort of loses all of its nutrients and it's very hard to bring that back to life and yeah that was the unique opportunity that the planet had during the pandemic you know less planes were in the sky less cars were on the road um we saw dramatic reductions in like visible pollution in a lot of cities and animals were playing where they hadn't played for you know centuries while it was an isolating time for us it allowed mother nature to catch her breath everything in Hosier's vision was movement and life and i think he probably spent a lot of time in nature during this uh isolation period and i think a lot of us especially when you are in a metropolitan area you see natural spaces as very still and calm when really it's teeming with so much movement and life more than we'd ever be able to comprehend the mention of the riverboat here could be a nice little nod to um, the riverboat that's guided by Charon on the river Styx, since we're still in that inferno headspace wildflower and barley barley is something that is harvested it so it's planted and tended to and you typically only see barley in a barley field but as I said the world was given space to breathe and time to grow its hair out per se. Um, so Hosier is drawing our attention to the rare sight of wildflowers being among crops. Springtime in the country, I can smell summer on its breath. Low and harrowed lie the fields and the heart of me. Everything in my vision, departure and death, riverboat, wheelbarrow, wildflower and barley. So this is essentially flipping the first part of the verse and viewing it in a negative light, you know, reflecting on the loss of life at this time. And I guess kind of like too sweet, there's this contrast of dark and light in this song. Harrowed fields are when there's no vegetation, they've been plowed up, um, ready to be planted. And he uses this image to compare with the state of his heart, which I'm gonna go ahead and say is probably the first time ever anyone's ever used that sort of analogy. He's a trailblazer. This year, I swear it will be buried in actions. This year, I swear it will be buried in words. Some close to the surface, some close to the casket. I feel useful as dirt, put my body to work. Those first two lines, I think maybe in reference to how the pandemic is something that we don't talk about that much. It, it's almost like that time didn't exist. We all agree that 2020 was an, a non-year. We, we just blank it out. And, you know, all of the activity and news and stuff that has happened since we've come out of that state has sort of buried the memory of it. Perhaps this is a promise he's making to himself. Like he's had this time to reflect and now he's decided that those words and actions will be his, which I think goes along nicely with the, I feel useful as dirt, put my body to work. I actually just want to read something that Hosea has said um, about this song and in particular the dirt reference. A kind of love song, but also at the time when everybody was stationary and static and useless in a time of such crisis. This song is also trying to recognize the usefulness of dirt, the usefulness of soil in which facilitates the growth of something that cannot die, of something perpetual, will always come back, will always grow, that facilitates the renewing of a new generation, facilitates the renewing of a new world, that facilitates creation. Referencing the lyrics in first time, fighting off like all creation, the absence of itself. Now during this chorus, Alice and Russell can be heard singing the backing sort of in an almost round like style, like it reminds me of the rounds we used to learn in choir. Some of the lines are the healers are healing, the diggers are digging the earth. And I think this just really nicely affirms that idea of nature being healed by itself. Um, you know, creatures digging into the earth and cultivating the ground in the way that it always should have been. But I think like the contrast we see in the first verse, there is a darker side to this, particularly with the diggers. Um, I think maybe referencing the fact that we were digging so many more graves than we usually were at that time. I remember in America, they were having a massive problem with funeral homes, like not having enough space because they were overrun. It just doesn't feel real that all of that happened. It, it, it's insane. Springtime in the city, the canal banks are empty again. The grass crying out to be heated by bodies, the streets for the laughter of young women and men. Canal boat and trolley, wildflower and barley. This verse is pretty clear in what it's trying to say, but it's so powerful at the same time. Springtime, it's getting warmer. These places are supposed to be populated and yet they lay there waiting. I'll quote Hosier again, referencing the stillness and the sort of eerie, unhappy quiet of living in the countryside or living in the city, seeing empty streets, seeing empty roads. I kind of wrote a playful song around that. I think the trolley reference is like a funny little addition, particularly as it's not the first time that Hosier has uh, referenced 
trolleys in his song in we got the line i'd settle for a shopping trolley in the liffy in anything but so i can't help but think of like this trolley just cheerfully floating down the canal while you know the rest of the place is abandoned almost like nature sort of beginning to erase the human world. Like the trolley is the first thing that it sends on its way. <laughs> the next chorus is essentially the same, but they say unreal on earth. A titular moment, yay. Springtime from my window. Another month has not much longer now. The sun hesitates more on each evening's darkening. Would all things God allows it remain above ground like grief and sweet memory, wildflower and barley. God, it's just, it's so good. <laughs> I feel this song so deep within me. And I'm just so thankful that Hosier has been able to bring it to life. It's an ode to nature and its perseverance and uh, it's a tribute to the people we lost. And I want this played at my funeral. Dead serious, like as I'm being committed to the earth. Play this, please. Empire Now. I was not expecting this one. I'm not going to lie. Sonically, not my favourite. I feel it's a bit overproduced. But that's okay, because the lyrics go hard. Let's just jump straight into this first verse. Sun coming up on a dream come around, 100 years from the empire now. Sun coming up on a world that's easy now, 100 years from, 100 years from. This is very clearly going to be talking about Irish independence. Ireland gained independence from the British Empire in 1921, um, just over 100 years ago, so there's a very easy connection there. And this mention of the sun, I think, is also very significant because the British Empire was known as the empire on which the sun never set. In its heyday, Britain controlled 25% of the world's landmass. Crazy. Um, and their territories reached so far that there was always daylight somewhere. Their land could never be fully encompassed by the night. Obviously the sun did eventually set on that empire, although the ramifications of its control still remain, unfortunately. Um, it, the sun can now come up on a new era. After all, darling, I wouldn't sell the world. The way that things are turning, if it falls, I would hold on for all it's worth. The future's so bright, it's burning. This brings me back again to an interview where Hosea said that he wasn't optimistic, but he was well, he wasn't optimistic about the world, but he is optimistic about people. And that's what he's holding on to. And he's sort of accepting fate and accepting consequences because it's the right thing. Like if the world goes down, it's because it needs to. If rebellion leads to this whole thing ending, so be it, because it takes the suffering with it. I think that's what he means here by the future so bright it's burning. It's like the flames of revolt and or climate change, natural disasters, that sort of stuff. Again. We see that idea of experiencing everything the world has to offer, including the darkest parts, because that's all we can really do with the short amount of time that we have. Our existence is so tiny, really. The martyrs of our revolution, their spinning caused the earth to shake. The problem brought its own solution. They power now the world we've made. Given the context of Irish independence, I'm gonna say that these martyrs are probably the 16 that were executed after the Easter Rising of 1916. It was the most significant uprising since the rebellion of 1798. 485 people were killed and 3,500 were taken as prisoners by the British. It was a tragedy, but also an incredibly important historical event for Ireland as it dramatically increased the support for independence, um, which they would then get five years later. So their rebellion did cause the earth to shake it changed people's minds and it sparked something. The problem brought its own solution, I think can be taken in two different ways. The more obvious being that humans, we are the problem and we will inevitably bring about our own downfall, sort of like a prophecy, um, whether that be through pillaging the earth or extinction through war, we will bring our own solution. The other way it could be read is that where there is oppression, there will always be those in the oppressed group that are ready to fight back. And so the oppressors are always going to bring their own downfall in the end. There's a lot of repetition in this track, so we're not blessed with a load of lyrics that we can process, but I think what's there gives a really strong and true message. Chaos is golden, embrace it and embrace revolution. And lastly, we have the very aptly named Farewell. And this one, I'm, 
I'm gonna need a word with Andrew because I'm not happy with the position that he's put me in. Do you all remember when I talked about abstract psychopomp and how I couldn't emotionally handle it because I get really intense intrusive thoughts about animal suffering or about my own pets dying in a really horrific way? Do you remember that? Imagine my reaction when I heard the lyrics, hedgehog under a van wheel. Yeah, nice one, mate. Thanks for that. I, I wouldn't fare well, and I, I couldn't fare well. Hedgehog under a van wheel kind of wouldn't fare well. Out here trying to feel good again. And I, I wouldn't fare well. A kitten cozy in the engine type of wouldn't fare well. A dog deep in the chocolate kind of wouldn't fare well. Out here trying to feel good again. Okay, yeah, so the first note I wrote in my book was fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> underlined. So I think what's happening here is Hosea is seeking out pleasure that he know won't end well. These scenarios are brief highs um, before catastrophic ends. Um, you know, the engine is cozy and the chocolate tastes good. I'll take any high, any glazing of the eyes, any solitary pleasure that was sorrow in disguise. Let the sun only shine on me through a fallen sky. I'll be all right. He's turning to substances or another type of addictive vice, things that make you feel good when nothing else will. And he's doing that within the context of the state of the world and almost welcoming it, like resigning to his fate, let the sun only shine on me through a falling sky. He's saying, give me that shred of joy uh, amongst the disaster, which is pretty heavily confirmed with the next lines. Joy, disaster, come unbound here. I'll deny me none while I'm allowed with all things above the ground. There's that common theme, again, of wanting to feel everything while alive, including all the worst parts of the human experience. I'm just gonna reread that verse again because it is pure poetry, like literally something you would read and study in a poetry class. Joy, disaster, come unbound here. I'll deny me none while I'm allowed with all things above the ground. Put that on my gravestone, I'm dead serious. And I, I wouldn't fare well. A whale swimming up Samidagawa wouldn't fare well. Critic hoping to be remembered wouldn't fare well. Out here trying to feel good again. The Samidagawa is a river that runs through Tokyo and sort of lined with quite heavy metropolitan construction. Um, not really any raw natural um, shorelines. So yeah, a whale wouldn't fare well especially because it's going up river, not towards the sea. I'm wondering if that line about critics is directed at anyone in particular. It feels kind of bitchy and I love that because critics don't get remembered. They don't exist without art to critique. Their whole career is dependent on the hard work of others. Just like my channel is dependent on Hosier. <laughs> Sonically, I, I really love this track. There's something so uh, very true to his roots about it. It's a lot of folk elements, especially um, the clapping and the string sections. There's something very um, cranberries about his vocals as well. I, I'm wondering if he was listening to a lot of them <laughs> during this time. But yeah, this song feels very um, woven into history, almost as if it, it existed well before Hosier put pen to paper. He was, they were just sort of, it was waiting to be extracted out, you know? Now I've done a lot of talking <laughs> and if you've made it this far, uh, thank you so much. That honestly means so much, um, but now I'm gonna extend the talking stick to you. <laughs> Everything I've said is just my interpretation. And the beautiful thing about art is that there is no correct or incorrect way to view it. Everyone can take something different from it and that is celebrated and encouraged on this channel. So please, if you have a different view or you just wanna build on something I've said, or perhaps I've missed something completely, please don't hesitate to uh, start the conversation in the comments below. I can't wait to jump in there and talk with you guys. If this is our first time meeting, hello, I'm Anna, and thank you so much for being here and taking the time out of your day to uh, spend it with me. On this channel, we cover all things music, not just Hosier, but a lot of Hosier. And if you would like to be part of our little community here, because it's a pretty great little group, um, we would love to have you and all you have to do is subscribe. Thought I'd just tell you guys that Hosia is coming to my city in November and I managed to get GA standing tickets. I'm so excited. Um, so I will make sure to make a lot of great content out of that. If you like this video, a thumbs up would help me out a lot. And if you have some Hosia loving friends, share the link with them so we can all get in on this. I'm gonna stop talking because my throat is actually on fire. Um, follow me on Instagram for daily music recommendations. Thank you so much for being here. 
Thank you so much for your time. Um, have a wonderful week and I will see you very soon.